Runners, the next race will start in a moment. Runners to your mark. Set. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. Don't start the race without the winner. Come on. Jeez. Give me some time here, you know? Hey, be careful with that bag. All right. Runners, to your mark. Set. Whoa, 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 whoa. I gotta get ready. This guy here, such a hurry. <laughs> Swift. <laughs> now you may start the race. Jeez. Such Runners, to your mark. Set. Do whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I forgot to stretch. I forgot to stretch. You can't do one of these without stretching. Come on. I think I'm about good. I think I'm about good. Runners, to your mark. <sighs> Set. Whoa, 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 whoa. I forgot. <laughs> I'm on an empty stomach. I'm on an empty stomach. I can't. Yeah, here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Breakfast of champions right here. I'm telling you now. Oh, yeah, that's better. You want some cake? Nah. You can't have some cake. <laughs> Looks like you already had the loser cake. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, okay, should be a diet. Hey. <laughs> ah. Hey, man. You want an engraved invitation? Runners, <laughs> to your mark. Set. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute. I'm a little thirsty now. A little thirsty. Thirsty. Hey, what? It's diet. I'm on a diet. <laughs> you are the slowest starter. Hurry up. Runners, to your mark. Set. Go, whoa, 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 wait. I forgot. <laughs> Lucky charm, man. I'm sorry. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, man. Whew. Talk about a second wind, right? <laughs> <sighs> what are you looking at? I'm going to smoke you next. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Really? I mean, come on, I got places to be. Let's do Runners, this. to your mark. Set. Hey, I fired the starting pistol. What? I said I fired the starting pistol. You didn't hear it? Yeah, I heard it. It's loud. Well? Oh, you did great. I mean, you did great. The way you're standing up here with your tall, and, and the voice was great. Oh, and the gun. Man, I, I believe you were a Marine or something. No, no, it was no, no, no. great. That's not what I mean. I mean, are you going to run this race or not? <laughs> no. <laughs> Why would I? 
No, let me tell you something, man. I just do this so I can look good in front of other people, okay? <laughs> Run the race. <laughs> this guy's a comedian over here. Come on, come on, hurry up with the bag. Oh, hey, we are doing another race next weekend, right? Right? Hmm. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good Lord, I think we're all going to remember that. <laughs> what a wonderful way to end this uh, sanctuary time. But it does have a lot to do with the sermon, um, <clears throat> but no snap off pants. So that was good. Good job, guys. We're going to be in our text this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 4, looking at three verses this morning. As we wrap up this series we've been in for the last several weeks called Get Fit, Training Yourself for Godliness. And so I couldn't think of a better place to end this series than looking at the one guy other than Jesus in the New Testament that got it right. When we think of someone who was spiritually fit, only one person comes to my mind other than Jesus, and it is the Apostle Paul. And this particular text is at the end of his life. And so we're going to look at that in just a few moments, but as we're thinking about this idea of how physically fit and emotionally and relationally and all those different areas we've looked at, how it ties into our, our spiritual fitness, we're kind of reminded that being physically fit and it, through this diet and, and exercise, that takes great determination, doesn't it? Yeah, it takes dedication, it takes discipline. Getting healthy is not just this one-time decision, but it's thousands of little decisions every single day that a person has to make to be able to get there. Now, if they continue to do that, you know, they, they first get into the habit, and then if they continue that on and it becomes habitual, then eventually, uh, at least uh, in my experience and seeing other people as well, is that that habit becomes a passion. And then and if they keep going through that sort of phase of it being a passion, they're excited about it. You know, some people call it the runner's high or the pump in the gym or whatever it may be, but you're seeing results. And so then become, you become excited about what what is happening in and around you. And then that from that habitual side, it goes to the passion side. But if they stay with it, it eventually becomes a lifestyle, that that is who you are. You don't have to convince yourself, man, I need to get up and, and go to the gym. I don't really want to go to the gym, but I got to get up. It's just one thing that's part of your normal routine, or whether it's walking or whether it's eating right, whatever it is, there's this idea from habitual to passion to then a lifestyle. Well, to get there, there has to be this change in a person's mind, right? There has to be this change in a person's heart and their passion and their hands and their body needs to be devoted to something different than it was. What all this is about, physically anyway, is that they have to adopt a new lifestyle. It's not just I'm going to eat less hamburgers and I'm going to drink more Diet Coke. I'm going to adopt a new lifestyle. Well, the same thing is true that we have seen all week, uh, every week long when it comes to spiritually being spiritually fit. We are calling to adopt a, our calling is to adopt a new lifestyle. And it starts with a habit, maybe reading our Bible, maybe praying more regularly. And as we do that and we see God begin to work in us and around us and through us, that, that habit then becomes a passion. We're excited about what God's doing. And then it begins, begins to be our lifestyle of what God is doing. And it is who we are. It, we are known as, man, that person really follows Jesus. Man, that person really loves God. Look at his life lifestyle. And so that's happening, and, and I believe in our congregation it continues to happen, but there's one key component that we cannot miss. To get to this lifestyle, there are three things that we have to implement. There are three things that we have to remember, three things that we have to take action on, and I'm calling these the three keys of spiritual fitness. Because the point here is, are we beginning to pursue Christ above all else with everything that we are? 
Is he the goal of why we come to church? Is why we come here more important uh, to know Christ and to make him known more than it is to sing songs I really love, although I love the songs? Is Christ and pursuing Christ more important in my life and why I gather with God's people more important than even the people that I gather around with? We love fellowship. We love all those things. But to get to this lifestyle, it is a lifelong process. We are called to follow Christ for the long haul. So if we're going to follow Christ for the long haul, then we need to know how are we going to do that. So as much as uh, this matters to you know, physical fitness people, this should matter infinitely more to spiritually fit people. Because we're going to grow strong as spiritually uh, strong followers of Christ It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over a lifetime. And so I want to show you what Paul says about this. At the end of his life, in three little verses, he's writing to his young son in the ministry, Timothy. And here's what he says when it comes to what we need to remember and what Timothy needed to remember as he's thinking about growing spiritually strong and fulfilling God's calling in his life. Starting in verse 6, look there with me. It says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all who have loved his appearing. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for another time that we have to sit and to study before your word. God, we know that we are beggars asking for bread from you, that there's nothing that we can do in our own strength and our own intellectual ability to know what spiritually you want us to know this morning. And so we ask that as we come before you as beggars looking for bread, God, that you would break open the word of life, that you would feed it to us. God, that you would multiply it like you multiplied the fishes and loaves. And that you would put that word into every individual life because you and you alone know exactly what is happening in every one of our individual lives. And you know how to address those issues in our life with your word. And so we invite you to do that this morning. We invite the Holy Spirit to take God's word and to apply it to our life. So as we do this, God, Father, would you, would you magnify the person and the work of your son Jesus in our midst, that we may continue to worship you as we hear the preaching of your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's three quick uh, truths that we see here. And I say quick because the sermon today, the message is really three parts. The message aspect is only part one, so we're going to kind of go through this kind of quickly before we uh, look at the Lord's Supper and how Jesus fulfills this, and then we'll get to the last part of the celebration of what God has done here. So the very first truth that we see here is found in verse 6, and it is uh, one of the keys to a spiritually healthy life or a lifestyle is that we must learn that your time is limited. Learn that your time is limited. Look what Paul says here, verse 6. He says, for I am already, not that I'm going to be, not that one day this is going to happen. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So Paul first here gives us a glimpse into his present situation. Paul, he knows the likelihood of his coming martyrdom, and it is approaching quickly, and that death is imminent. This is, like I said, the last letter of Paul that we have that's this most personal to his young protege, Timothy, and Paul is writing this in a Roman prison, chained to a Roman guard, and he knows that his time is limited. In fact, we know historically that Paul wrote this letter about two years before he is martyred. And so he's telling Timothy, here's what my last will and testament is. Here's what you need to know to continue to follow God's call on your life. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul pulls from the Old Testament here. The drink offering was uh, an an action that would uh, accompany one of the other offerings. They would offer 
this, this uh, sacrifice of the, the fellowship offering. And then the end of that would be the, the priest would pour out this wine onto the altar. It was a sacrificial act, a symbol of giving ourselves wholly to the Lord. And so Paul says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. Paul knows that God is sovereign over everything in our life. Caesar would not be the one to kill Paul. No one. The executioner would not be the one to kill Paul. Paul understood that he is offering himself as a sacrifice to Christ. He is being poured out. God is pouring Paul out for the glory of God and the good of the church here. And so Paul is absolutely at peace with this. He knows his present condition. He says, I am being poured out as an offering. In fact, that's why he wrote uh, Romans 12 too, a living sacrifice. He knows what it means to be poured out as this kind of offering. And then he says, and the time of my departure has come. That's such a good word picture. This whole, these whole three verses are filled with such good word pictures from the Greek. This particular one, departure, it, it is the Greek word enelusis, and it means to loose something, to untie it, to unbind it, or someone to set it free. In the Greek culture, this was most often used for someone about to set sail or to take a trip, and they're going to be, they're, they're going to set loose. They're saying their goodbyes in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way. So they're going to go somewhere. They're being separated. But this is also the word where we get the word analysis from. Analysis. It's the same word. And analysis is the separating of any material or abstract entity into its constituent elements. That is the opposite of synthesis, bringing things together. Analysis is separating them out to figure out how does each part work. And we see that, like if you're in the sciences, I'm not a very scientific-minded guy. Uh, I went through sciences in school and college and all that, but, you know, I mean, if you've ever looked at under an electron microscope, it's a very powerful microscope, and it really looks down to deep, deep down into substructures and things like that, and you can see all kinds of different parts. It's separating the parts out and so that you can investigate how each part works and how each part works together. Well, what happens when you stand before God's Word and you let God's Word analyze what is going on in your life, it, are you staying before God's Word? Do you understand that your time is limited, that there is coming a day where death will close this chapter for every single person in here? It did for Paul, and it will for me, and it will for you. And there's only a limited amount of time for us to analyze what is going on in our life. Am I committed? Am I fulfilling what God has called me to do? Because my time is short, and your time is short. Life is like a vapor, James says, and we have to analyze, we have to investigate, is my life matter? Does it matter to the kingdom of God? Am I fulfilling what God has called me to do in this life? Paul here says one of the keys is that if we're going to grow as spiritually strong followers of Christ in a, a lifetime, then we have to understand that our time is limited. And I know that we have a lot of teenagers and kids in here and you think, man, your time's not limited. You have unlimited time, like unlimited lives of some video game, but that's not true, right? I mean, I know the older I get, the more I look back and like, man, life is flying by. Make it count. Make that life matter for the kingdom of God. Know that your time is limited. But then the second truth that we see here is that we're to live with no regrets, to live with no regrets. Paul moves from knowing what is happening in the present now to looking at what has happened in the past. He says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So in this, he uses two athletic images and then one other image that he gives us. The two athletic ones here are fighting the good fight and running the race. And when he says, I have fought the, fight, the good fight, that word fault is uh, a Greek word where we get the word agony from. It's, it's this idea that there's this agony that accompanies a fight. The Christian life, it is not all rainbows and roses, is it? No, it's not. We are engaged in a spiritual conflict. 
Ephesians 6.12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Peter describes our enemy as a ravenous lion going around looking for someone to devour. He wants to kill, he wants to steal, and he wants to destroy every man, woman, boy, and girl. And with this kind of conflict, there is always agony. But Paul was faithful. He fought the good fight. We too are to fight that good fight. When God calls us into his family to follow him, he puts us on his team. We are to fight the good fight. I mean, tomorrow's reminder is a perfect example of that. Of those who gave their last full measure of devotion, they fought the good fight. So we too must fight the good fight, spiritually speaking. There will be agony in this fight, but be faithful because Jesus has overcome. But then he says he also finished the race. Paul gives us this an, another athletic image. It was, it was one of Paul's favorite images that he would use. And we just saw a skit that highlighted that imagery. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, do you know or not know that a, in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. The Christian life is not just a battleground, it is also a, a, a race that is happening, a spiritual race. Not, pro, not for the prize of salvation, but for the prize of knowing Christ Jesus more and more, being changed into the likeness of Christ more and more. And if you don't know, want to know Jesus more and more, I don't understand why you would want to be on his team. That's what this is about is that he's changing us from the inside out to reflect more of who he is. And Paul here says he ran the race according to the rules. He's so close to the end. He can now say that he has finished his race. Man, I look for that day where if God is gracious enough to allow me and maybe you to know that the end is near, to be able to say, I have finished the race. I've done what God's called me to do. And I pray that for every single one of you, whether we know when our time has come or whether we don't, but that we live each day with no regrets so that we can say we finished this race. And then he says, I kept the faith. This is an image of an employee who has faithfully guarded his boss's deposit given to him. The verb here is a, is a Greek perfect active, and all that means is that perfect means that it's his past action that has lasting and current effects. And it's active because it was Paul doing this. No one else is doing this for Paul. He says, I have kept the faith. Paul kept the faith. Paul kept the main thing, the main thing. What is the main thing? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul never strayed from the gospel. No matter what letter you read in the New Testament that Paul wrote, and he wrote half of it, nowhere will you ever see that Paul moves on from the gospel. It is everything. It is because why we are justified, it will lead to us being in our being sanctified, and it will lead to us being glorified. The gospel is everything. Paul kept the gospel. Paul kept the faith. He believed it. He lived it. He shared it with others. He did what God called him to do and sent him to do. Paul kept the faith. Jesus did it through Paul, but he did not do it for Paul. We have a personal responsibility to take what God has given us in the gospel, to live it out, and to share it with others. We are to live with no regrets. One of my favorite hymns is the chorus of it is, Take up thy cross and follow me. I heard my master say, I give my life to ransom thee. Surrender your all today. And here's the chorus part. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. When I think of the history of this church, Highland has always been a church that pursues Christ above all else. That doesn't mean that every decision and every person in this church has been perfect, but they have the heart that wants to pursue Christ above all else. And so as we transition to this next chapter of church life, here at Highland, we still have the same choice that Paul had to make. 
We have to make that choice. Will we collectively and individually pursue Christ above all else? Will we give Christ our everything? Will we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? We must continue to take up our cross and follow him. We must continue to fight the good fight. We must continue to finish this race, and we must continue to keep the faith. No one is going to do these things for me, and no one is going to do these things for you. Each one of us has a personal responsibility to take up our cross and follow Jesus above all else. No one wants to have a deathbed experience where we're, we were wishing and regretting. We would have taken our relationship with Jesus more seriously. Follow Jesus, no regrets. And then the third truth that Paul outlines for us here is to look forward to your reward. Look forward to your reward. So we've looked at the present condition of Paul, and then he turns his view to the past. Now he's going to turn his view to what's coming in the future. Verse 8, look there with me. He says, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The result here of Paul's labor of love was that there was laid up for him a crown of righteousness. If you've been with us on Wednesday nights, uh, as we've gone through Revelation, you've heard about this crown. You've heard about two types of crowns that we have uh, in, the, uh, in, in the book of Revelation. This one is the Stephanos crown, the victor's crown. An athlete would be competing in a Roman game, and, and if he won, then the, uh, the emperor or the ruler of the town would place this wreath uh, sewn together through leaves onto that person's head. It was the victor's crown. Now, in and of itself, the crown wasn't worth anything. It was just a bunch of leaves strewn together and placed on someone's head. But what it represented was everything to the person. It represented victory that this person had overcome, and not only overcome, Overcome, but the person in charge saw that and awarded it to him. It, what it meant was everything. And spiritually speaking, it means everything to Paul, and it should mean everything to us, that one day Christ is going to award those who follow him this crown of righteousness. So why is it called a crown of righteousness? Because the greatest need that we have as sinful humans is to be made right with a holy God. We are to be made righteous because we are unrighteous. The crown of righteousness will be awarded to every believer, not on their own merits, not on their own righteousness, but on Christ. We know that our righteousness, according to Isaiah, is like filthy rags. But Christ, who knew no sin, was made to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. So in Christ's victory, we have victory. Because of what he accomplished at the cross and in the grave and in resurrection, we have that kind of reward and victory awaiting us. There's coming a day, Paul says, when all of God's people will stand before him on that, in, in front of that glorious throne on which our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous judge, will award all believers with the victor's crown. Paul will get a victor's crown. Billy Graham will get a victor's crown. I think about Dr. Gordon Sansing, the, the man who led me to the Lord and, and baptized me. He will get a victor's crown. But I also think of Miss Sue, who also discipled me after I became a Christian, and she will also get a victor's crown. From the youngest follower of Jesus to the oldest follower of Jesus. From the most well-known follower of Jesus to the most unknown follower of Jesus. For all those who have loved Jesus' appearing, meaning they have loved Jesus, they will receive a crown of righteousness, won for them by Jesus Christ, this righteous judge. And Paul's statement here literally begs the question, doesn't it? Do you love his appearing? Do you really love? love his appearing do you love it when the lord is moving in his church do you love it when the lord is moving in your life rearranging things in your life do you love and think about his appearing his coming is that a good thing for you or would you rather it be another day do you love his appearing 
If so, the crown of righteousness awaits for you. If not, let me tell you how you can love his appearing. The Bible is absolutely clear that every one of us has sinned. It is also clear that there's nothing that we can do to erase our sin. And the Bible is equally as clear that we stand to be judged by God because of our sin. But God, in his grace and mercy, sent his son Jesus. And Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin, the penalty of our sin. He died, but three days later he rose from the grave. And he's alive today and he wants to save you. Yes, he wants to save you. He wants to set you on a new path of life, his way of life. But you have to trust in him. Romans 10, 9, Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. No, you will be saved. That is a promise from God. You will be saved if you come to Jesus for salvation. So the question is, do you want Jesus to save you this morning? I know there's gotta be somebody in here that does not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Do you want Jesus to save you? Do you want your sins to be paid for? Do you want this new way of life that Jesus is calling you to? Do you want to love his appearing? In just a few moments, Ken's going to come and he's going to lead us. We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to be down front. It may not be for salvation. If that is it, then you don't wait. You come down. Let's talk about that. Jesus wants to save you. You need to get that straight today. It may be that you want to join what God is doing here at the Highland family, that God's been calling you. You've been saying no, but today is the day that you are going to say yes to Jesus in that. It may be that you need prayer. Whatever it is, Ken, you go ahead and come on, and we're going to stand, we're going to sing, and we're going to give Jesus our all during our response time. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? If you're thinking, man, it's 1045. We're, we're early getting out. We're not done yet. So <laughs> that was part one of the message. Part two is I want us to turn our attention to how Christ fulfills everything that Paul was just speaking about. Because as great as Paul is, Jesus is our great example. He is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And Jesus also knew that he had limited time. In fact, in John 9, 4, he speaks, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So it's not surprising that if you look in Luke 9, 51, that in the first half of Luke, at Luke 9, 51, because time was so important to Jesus, he says in Luke 9, 51, Luke says that Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. That at the beginning of Luke's gospel, Jesus is already looking forward to getting to the cross. He knows that his time is limited. Nothing will take him away from the cross. He's dead set, so to speak, on the cross. He's heading there. He knows his time is limited. But he knows also that he has lived with no regrets. His time eventually did come, John 17, that's what he says there, and he went to the cross as an innocent man. He was beaten, spit upon, mocked, ridiculed, humiliated, and he was crucified between two common thieves. And as he neared the end of his earthly life, John records Jesus' dying words. We know that he lived with no regret, regrets because he said these three simple words, it is finished. He had done everything that God the Father had sent him to do. He lived with no regrets. He gave everything he had to serve the Father's will, to serve as a reminder and, and a memorial of how he lived and how he loved. Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, instituted the Lord's Supper. There's nothing magical about these particular elements, but there's something extremely important to what these symbols point us to. The bread reminds us of the body that was broken for each one of us on the cross. The blood reminds us of the blood of Jesus that was shed for each one of us on the cross. The Lord's Supper is reserved for those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus. So if you need one of these element cups, the bread and the juice cup, would you raise your hand and there's a deacon that would be glad to serve you. We need one here. 
Anybody else? You good? I know these are a little tricky. If you can kind of peel the top layer off first, get it started, that's the bread. Hear the word of the Lord, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he, when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the body of your son, Jesus Christ, that was broken for us. We thank you that in him we have life and life abundantly. We ask that you would sustain us by your grace as bread sustains our physical bodies. We pray this in the life-giving name of Jesus. Amen. Also, the word of the Lord, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-five 25, and 26 says, In the same way, he also took the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray again. Father, again, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for each one of us. We thank you that there is power in his blood, the power to cleanse us completely, the power to wash us whiter than snow, power to even turn your wrath from us. And we praise you for the atoning sacrifice of your only son. And it is Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. And we know that Jesus also looked forward to his reward. Hebrews 12, 2 says, that looking to Jesus, the author or the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of, God, of the throne of God. Jesus did it all for the joy of pleasing his Father. And as we also know that our time is limited, we want to live and love like Jesus with everything that we have because we know that our reward awaits us as well when we see Jesus face to face one day. And we get to enjoy not the bread and the juice in a cup like this, but in the supper that he has prepared and will serve us himself. Amen? So for the last portion of our time together this morning, we want to turn our attention to a celebration of what the Lord has done in this sacred space for the last 44 years. November 7th, uh, 1976, is when... You first, and some of you were in here, first came in to this building. Raise your hand if you were in that first service. I'm curious. Was anybody in that first service? Greer, you were a baby, weren't you? Yeah. Who else was here? Raise your hand. Wow. You can't remember? Is that what you said? Okay. <laughs> 19, uh, I mean, 1976, November 7th. You know... This is our sanctuary, and the word sanctuary, it comes from sanctus, the Latin word for holy. It's a holy or a sacred space, and we know that the church is the people of God. We, we get that, but this building, this time, this space is not like any other space. It's not like our living room um, that we lounge in. It's not like the gym. It's not like anywhere else. It's not like anywhere else in all of God's creation. Because it is where the people of God have decided to come together to listen to God, to worship God, and to respond to God at the same time each week. This is a sacred space, a holy place that God has given to us. And as we close this chapter of Highland's story, we want to celebrate what uh, God has done in this sacred space. So you saw a lot of the... Uh, 
the pictures that, or the, the names that went by and everything that God has done in our, our church over the last 44 years with the, from the pastors to uh, the, all the staff. And God has just really blessed this church with all kinds of servants that he has put in and out of this church. And, and I wanted to show you particularly uh, what God has done through the last 44 years. I asked our staff to put this together. They worked really hard on this all week, because it was, a, or last two weeks, it was really difficult to find a lot of this. Um, I mean, Marcia was digging through all kind of old evangels, and I mean, uh, they, they kind of roped in some other people to help. And so thank y'all for doing this, but just notice what God's done. And while we celebrate what God is doing, who he is in our midst, baptisms, you know, representing 599 people that have come to faith, that have followed Jesus in believer's baptism. That's awesome, guys. Almost 600 people. Can we give God a hand for that? The fact that we've had 46 deacons that have been ordained as servants in the church. 22 people have been called to, uh, to ministry out of this church in the last 44 years. 139 days devoted to God doing revival in our hearts. And then $40 million given to, uh, in tithes and offerings. And this is not counting the CDC, by the way, if you're one of those number crunchers. We separated that out as best as we could. This is just what God's people have given in this room as a response to who God is and what he has done. And now it is not about the money, but that money represents what God has done in his kingdom because that money doesn't stay here. That money has gone all around the world. It has helped fund missions. It has helped build churches around the world. Some of you have gone on missions because of that right there. God has moved generously through the hearts of his people uh, in the last 44 years. And I know that he's going to continue to do that as well. But these are just a, a snapshot of the 44 years that God has blessed this church. And I am so looking forward to what he's gonna do in the next chapter. And one of the things that the staff also helped with was putting this little booklet together. I'm not gonna read all this to you, uh, uh, but I do encourage you to get one of these little memory booklets, read it today, and then pray and thank the Lord for his continued work in this church. I have enjoyed reading every one of these. They are so good. They're, they're filled with special memories of why this space right here, why this time is so sacred to them. It's everything from, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Rick put standing on the ladder uh, changing these light bulbs in here, from that to people, their, their kids, their grandkids have given their life to Jesus here. They've seen God do amazing things, amazing works in their life. So I, I, I want to encourage you to get one of these little booklets. You may want to use it just in your devotion time this week. Read one and then thank God for whatever that is that uh, is being uh, highlighted in there. And thank God for that servant there and what God has done in their life. Now, to finish everything out, I think it would be appropriate that uh, if I could do a congregational prayer on our behalf to the Lord. So would you bow with me? We give you thanks, O oh Lord, and we call upon your name. We will make known your deeds among the peoples. How you have blessed this church with your goodness and glory throughout the last 44 years. How you have saved nearly 600 souls. How you have blessed this church with faithful pastors and staff and fruitful ministries. We will continue to tell of how you have called 22 men into ministry to serve our church, how you have blessed our church with the deacon body you have called to serve alongside the pastor. We will make known how you have moved in the hearts and minds of your people at Highland, that they would partner with you and give generously to the building of your kingdom. We will make known how you have used music in this space to bring glory to your name and souls into your kingdom. And so, Lord, we thank you for the last 44 years in this sanctuary. We know that it hasn't been easy, that there has been hurt and pain felt in these walls, that there have been those who have come broken and lonely. But we know that our story, because of you, is not over. And as we turn this page, a new part of our story, we're looking forward to seeing how you write that, Lord. So as we renovate this space we ask that you would continue to renovate our passion for following Jesus. 
As we renovate this space, we ask that you would renovate our hearts. As you renovate, as we renovate this space, we ask that you would renovate and invigorate our passion for the lost. May we seek you and your strength. May we seek your presence continually. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I, for one, am looking forward to what God is going to continue to do in the life and in the family of Highland. Before we're done, before we leave, I want you to check out the upcoming video uh, for our upcoming sermon series, and then I'll make one announcement, and then we're done. about our brand new series coming up in June and July called Road Trip. We're on a road trip right now. And so, what? Uh, do you remember the old school road trips that maybe you took as a kid? Maybe you loaded up in the station wagon or maybe it was a minivan and you had a destination in mind. Maybe it was Wally World, whatever, you know? And so, you were heading there, but yes, there was the destination, but it was all these little roadside attractions that just made the trip worth it. And so maybe you stopped at like the alligator farm or, or maybe you stopped at the world's largest cedar bucket, um, by the way, is in Mississippi. So maybe you stopped there. I mean, you're not gonna spend an entire week, right, at uh, looking at a bucket, but you could spend a few hours of a day looking at that bucket, that would be cool. And so, but you just moved on to the next one until you reached that uh, destination. Well, for June and July, we're going to take a biblical road trip through the books of the Bible that only have one chapter. And so books like Obadiah, I mean, you're not, we're not gonna spend six weeks looking at Obadiah, but we could spend one week and gain, and gain what God is saying there, and then we'll move on to Philemon, and then 2 John, 3 John, and finish it up with Jude. So we're gonna take a biblical road trip, looking at what God is saying through his word. If all of scripture is breathed out by God, then all of it is inspired from Obadiah all the way to Jude. And so we're looking forward to that and what God's gonna do. And the way that we're gonna do that is we're gonna invite you on this trip with us. And so if you've never been on a road trip, well, come along with us. Um, and so we're going to uh, go all around Mississippi and we're starting that today. And so uh, we're, we can't wait to share with where we're gonna be and, and you get to see and follow along each week where we're gonna be all around Mississippi. And so we hope you'll join us and you'll enjoy this trip as we take this road trip through God's word and through Mississippi. After 900 miles in Mississippi in two days with Clint, <laughs> we're still friends. <laughs> no, we had a good time. I, we're so excited about this series and seeing the different places we've uh, visited all over Mississippi from the far north to the far uh, south to uh, both ends of the spectrum. Um, so we're looking forward to the new series coming up next week, Road Trip, which is not going to be in here, right? We're moving out. These pews actually won't be here next week. Uh, they'll be gone. So if you come in here, you'll just have to sit on the floor. But we're going to be in the FLC starting next week. All right, would you stand? And we're going to be dismissed. Thank you so much for being here with us. If I haven't met you yet and you are a first-time guest or a guest that uh, I still haven't been able to meet yet, I would love the opportunity to do that. I'll be standing out front. Um, 
would love just a second just to, to meet you and uh, hear how uh, I can uh, answer some of your questions that you may have about Highland. Look, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the goodness of your word, the goodness of worship, God. We look forward to what you're going to do in our family here at Highland in the days ahead. God, would you continue to use us as your ambassadors out in this world? God, may the word of Jesus, the gospel, be on our hearts and, and on our lips. God, help us to be part of your mission this week. We love you so much, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.